There we go. Looks like we're recording. Carrie, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Very good. Hello. This uh, welcome to the podcast for Multi Faith Matters. I'm John Moorhead, and this is our guest today is Carrie Graham, and I've had the pleasure of serving with uh, Carrie on a. It started as a grant project. She came midway in our initial grant um, as one of our part of our pastoral team. And uh, then she had uh, the good sense or the foolishness to stay on for the second grant. And uh, she's been a real blessing providing us a, a, a much needed perspective to what we're doing uh, on the grant team, which is now transitioning into something else, which is why we're doing this podcast. But Carrie is uh, the pastor of a unique uh, church experiment called the Church Lab, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, Carrie, introduce yourself a little bit more than that poor introduction I gave you. <laughs> sure. Well, I find it difficult even for me to describe exactly what I'm doing. So, uh, so kudos already that you've gotten a good start. Um, yeah, I spend half of my time pastoring the Church Lab, which is a micro community that emphasizes spiritual maturity is the shorthand. Now, what that entails and the activities we emphasize, we're going to talk about. I think we lost her. We may have to start. Whoop, there we go. You're back. <laughs> Sorry for the glitch. Um, Let's continue on. So, yeah, I spend the other half of my time pastoring pastors. So I uh, work as a consultant for about a couple dozen pastors uh, throughout Texas and uh, mainly through cohort work. Um, so I'll meet with pastors for a three-year period of time and work with them on issues that they're facing in the changing religious landscape as leaders. And then I sort of find myself between my two roles, uh, learning from one in my less traditional role and how to help those in more institutional positions. And then vice versa, understanding kind of what's at play in the institution and taking that back into a translatable way into the church lab. So yeah, that's a little bit of what I do. Okay. Uh, you're doing work with a lot of different demographic groups, a lot of different religious groups, uh, non-religious groups. What, what is your background and how did you get into this very unique approach and what kinds of people are you interacting with? Sure, um, let's see. So I, I originally got into interfaith work while I was getting my MDiv at Fuller uh, Seminary in Pasadena, California, and was invited on a trip to Utah uh, for a dialogue between uh, two evangelistic traditions, right? Evangelical Christians and LDS folks. And while I was there, I really had no idea what I was doing there. I was grateful for the trip. It was, you know, grateful, grateful for the experience, but but didn't have any sense of what it meant. And I remember sitting at a table with some other students, both LDS and evangelical Christians, and uh, noticing that it was the first time in my life I had uh been in a room with evangelistic traditions that were not trying to convince each other of something, mm. but were rather navigating themselves in this very different way. And I had a personal worshipful experience experiencing that. And um, I found that my pneumatology or my sense of how the Holy Spirit works was deeply defined by that moment and has has continued to grow in that vein ever since. So when I flew back to California, I just started facilitating interfaith dialogue basically with anybody who would let me try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and initially that was LDS mm -hmm. and uh, Jewish friends and uh, most of whom were studying uh, to become rabbis. Mm. And then when I eventually moved to Austin, it became much less about leaders in training and much more about whomever would join. So it's grown to be more, um, let's see, we've had, goodness, um, mainline Protestant, evangelicals, Catholic, pagan, Shia, Sunni, and Ahmadiyya Muslim, Jewish, mystic, agnostic, atheist, uh, LDS, if I had not said that yet, uh, all sorts, all sorts of folks, spiritual, but not religious being more and more common in the way people identify. Uh, so kind of it, it's gotten to run the gamut, uh, over the years and who's, who's taken part in the conversations. 
what kind of age demographics do you tend towards the younger or is it a mix or what's that look like? Well, it depends on what younger is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be careful. Uh, but, uh, our youngest it, right now is about 20. She started coming to dialogues when she was still in high school. Um, our older, man, I don't want to make guesses, but uh, probably our oldest is like 50s or 60s. We've got some in their 40s. I would say the majority are between mid-20s and mid to late 30s. Okay, so even with the upper end, it's still very youthful, yes. We don't have a, <laughs> we don't have a lot of folks who are like in their 80s, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, now, how did you form the church lab? Well, this is obviously isn't your traditional kind of bricks and mortar, uh, even the organizational structure. How is it designed to facilitate what you're trying to do? Sure. Uh, logistically, missionally, either one. Yeah, either one. Yeah. Okay. So from a very sort of just operational logistic standpoint, uh, we started a little over five years ago, and once the kind of mission and vision were in place, it became a lot about figuring out how to operationally align with the mission. This is what I talk with more institutional leaders about sometimes, because I think as the religious landscape changes, some of our traditional operational work uh, ends up turning against itself and against the mission, right? Uh, and I could talk about that. Uh, more in another podcast. <laughs> but but uh, so we started fundraising and thinking about how do we sustain what we're doing, knowing it's non-traditional. Um, and, and so we raised some money, then we raised more money, and we put a big chunk of that in savings so that mm -hmm. if our experiments started to go downhill, we had uh, a nice uh, cushion to sort of uh, be able to fail essentially right. as part of our laboratory that's necessary right and then otherwise um we sought out individual donors and relationships with those donors who could really get behind the mission and initially it was outside donors with the goal that within the first three to five years of building our community which is a micro community that they would opt in to becoming donors on their own and that that would be a metric we would use for effective ministry that that folks would elect internally to donate to the to the community. And that is exactly what we've experienced. Now we have a hybrid um, mix of folks outside and inside the organization that helps sustain what we're doing. And we're getting uh, involved enough now where we're doing consulting work and trainings that we're, we're obviously finding sustainable ways to charge for, which also helps mm -hmm. us grow and share what we're learning with others. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's talk about activities. It doesn't sound like you've got, again, a traditional kind of you show up, you sing your songs, you do your worship <laughs> and have your coffee and go home. So what, what does it look like in terms of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. good, good question. Well, a lot of the basis of what we do is to, at the core question, what uh, what counts as church, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what counts, what doesn't count? Um, and <laughs> depending upon who answers, does it matter? <laughs> um, right. Who needs to agree about that, right? Uh, and uh, as part of that, what spiritual needs are vital in a changing religious landscape? What needs are important to pay attention to? and what types of fears and anxieties that the institution might be experiencing, can we organize ourselves in a way to, to not have to get stuck in that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and over time, and predictably since I'm on this podcast, what, <clears throat> what I've discovered is that uh, dialogue communities feel a lot like accidental church communities. I used to pastor separately and do facilitation work with interfaith groups on the side. But I noticed over time that my interfaith groups felt sometimes more like church than the churches themselves. And that became an interesting question to go, well, what does that even mean when I hear myself say that? Uh, and and who would agree with that that's experiencing this? And so what, and we can talk more about that if you'd like, uh, but what our activities look like are biweekly dialogues on Monday nights, 
And on off weeks, there are Christians involved in those dialogues that opt into discipleship with me. Anybody, Christian or non-Christian, that wants pastoral care, they don't even have to be part of dialogue. Uh, I've got an atheist who calls me his spiritual director, right? Like, so part of the church lab is to be so broad that even people who wouldn't go to a dialogue, much less a church, still have somewhere to grow spiritually and to ask questions that they, they're not going to darken the door of an institution to ask, right? Mm -hmm. But we have found over and over again that while we focus on four pillars of spiritual growth, which includes dialogue, discipleship, mission, uh, and um, dialogue, discipleship, mission, and worship, that uh, three of the four of those needs tend to get met institutionally. And while we focus on all four, we center it around dialogue, partially because it's the most unmet need, but partially because we have found that all four of those needs get met in a dialogue community over time, which has astonished me, uh, but but is a, is a pretty secure pattern having facilitated for 10 years now uh, that all four of those pieces happen in an ongoing small group interface dialogue. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me with the continuing shift towards post-Christendom in America, increasing religious diversity, the church continuing to lose credibility, that this kind of model is increasingly important. Um, why would would you agree with that? Why, why do you see this as not just an experiment, but something that churches increasingly, even traditional churches, are going to have to start taking a look at? And then to make it more relatable to them, how do you connect the dots to your understanding of what Scripture is calling us to be as the church? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. That was a three-parter, yeah, right? That was huge. <laughs> Why, 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 is it, why is this important for the, the church in 21st century America, and how do you connect that to your understanding of Scripture? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So um, I've mentioned, I've used the phrase a couple of times, at least, the changing religious landscape in America. I use it several times a day, uh, I find, uh, with, with attendance across the board getting lower across the states, which of course there are still pockets right. uh, of communities where it's still going strong and evangelical communities in particular have some real strengths in, in many of their communities. The overall pattern is, is not that, right? The overall social pattern right now is less and less attendance. And generationally, as you've started to, to kind of veer toward that yourself, John, uh, generationally speaking, there's less and less concern with any type of, of right. worshiping community at all. So um, what we're finding here is that folks uh, will come to a dialogue, will exercise the muscle of listening deeply to other people, which is a muscle that people in worshiping communities or outside of them are oftentimes not given a chance to exercise and see how that grows them, right? So that's happening for everybody as a benefit. Additionally, you have folks, and this is true for the church lab, who will not darken the door of an institutional environment. There's too much baggage. There's too much lack of familiarity. There's anger, there's hurt, or there's just apathy because they've never been before and why would they go? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to be told what to believe. They don't want to be beaten over the head, nor do they want guidance that tells them what to believe. They want the tools that allow them to explore it for themselves. They want to be given the dignity of their own experiences and their own thoughts and questions. But they need a, a, and I know this is maybe a buzzword, but a safe, maybe we won't say safe space, but safe place, safe environment where people aren't going to uh, question their own judgment, but rather empower and support their pursuit of faith. Mm -hmm. We all have spiritual lives, whether we put it on the shelf or wrestle with it. I think oftentimes is a matter of if we have a space we deem safe enough. Um, supportive enough to ask what are pretty, you know, difficult questions, right. uh, but also questions that hold lots of meaning for our lives. And so when you have folks who are willing to come to a dialogue and wrestle there and know that they can ask questions and know that they can pursue extra tools outside of the dialogue if they choose a specific direction, which I, I hope they do, um, then you've got a really prime place for spiritual growth uh, that folks will show up to that doesn't act exactly like the institutional environment uh, and and acts as sort of a, an outpost for folks who aren't going to go to the institution anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Scripture. Yeah, scripturally speaking, you know, a lot of folks in dialogue use the love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm totally on, on that train. Right. Uh, I drink that Kool-Aid. But the one the one that I'm really uh, centering on these days is 1 John 4, 18, where we see that perfect love drives out all fear. And really the road I'm on is the one that says, you know what, we're in a really divisive area. Uh, socially, politically, we've got all this change in religion. I work with religious leaders every day who are tempted to make decisions out of fear and panic mm-hmm. about attendance, about butts in the seats. So what if we say, what does it look like for us to follow Jesus uh, where every day when we wake up, we do the hard work of sweeping out the fear and sweeping out the anxiety? Well, oftentimes fear and anxiety have to do with unfamiliar things, unknown people, unknown beliefs, unknown systems, unknown futures, and dialogue gets to the heart of all of those things. Yeah, that's a great scripture verse that I'm going to have to go back and reflect on because, you know, we did the grant research and discovered that fear was a huge motivating emotion as to why evangelicals uh, have negative thoughts and perceptions about Muslims and other religious groups. So we're not, we're not doing a very good job of tapping into that and living out that perfect love. So that's an awesome verse. Before we started the podcast, I mentioned to you, Barna has released some interesting stuff recently, and I wanted to kind of get your take on it, your feedback. A couple of weeks ago, they released some information where they they had polled um, different age groups within evangelicalism and discovered that millennials uh, tend to shy away from evangelism. They associate it with a lot of negatives. And Barna seemed to report that in it was a very concerning thing for them from where they're coming from with their demographic. They followed it up just yesterday with some, an interesting thing called uh, What Non-Christians Want from Faith Conversations, which is right up your alley. And the interesting thing is they listed a number of different things with some statistics. Non-Christians in conversations with Christians are looking for listening without judgment, allowing others to draw their own conclusions, uh, demonstrating an interest in somebody else's story or life. Um, knowing that person, being good at discussing. And what's interesting is while these percentage numbers for non-Christians are high in what they're looking for, the Christians they know in their life who have these characteristics are very low. So we're not connecting well with what people are looking for. What's your reaction to this? Absolutely no surprise whatsoever. Um, and I think reports like this are helpful, are helpful mirrors mm-hmm. to where we are and where we could be headed, right? Um, I tend to think that Christians in particular uh, have a unique benefit when they participate in dialogue that others um, others basically have, have been forced into all this time. And that is how to um, navigate life. Uh, n- not from a majority perspective. When we live in a majority mindset, as our, as many of us in this country have done for, you know, so, 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 so long, and people would, would argue about where the foundations of that should or should not be claimed. But when our school holidays and everything, you know, every little thing is sort of built around uh this Protestant culture, we don't even have to think about it. Mm -hmm. But anybody who's been in this country who doesn't participate in, in Christianity um, notices, right? We don't get uh, public Jewish holidays off or, you know, Muslim holidays, those sorts of things are uh, in many communities, not all, but in many communities, a little bit tougher to to navigate. So the impulse to accommodate the impulse to give dignity to other people's experiences, to trust the dignity of others' experiences, to not assume that maybe my experience is somehow more valid or more important or superior in some way to another person's. Those assumptions don't usually get to exist easily in a minority mindset. And so dialogue becomes just a daily habit. For Christians, we're not likely to be in the majority a whole lot longer and again, that's another fun podcast. <laughs> premise, but just for argument's sake here, for what Barna is mirroring back at us, Christians have a real opportunity to exercise some very Jesus-like muscles that we just haven't really had to because of the water that we swim in. Uh, so this this 
really trying to dig deep and understand our neighbor as a, as an impulse, as a pursuit of love toward them, not being threatened by that, but knowing it could deepen our faith in Christ. Uh, that's a road that many of us haven't taken because we haven't had to take it. Mm-hmm. So, so this new, uh, era of of trusting others experiences being more invitational and less overtly evangelistic uh, or less evangelistic in general uh, it doesn't mean we don't buy into evangelical theological tenets but it does mean that uh, trusting other people and trusting god's active work among people wherever that leads uh, feels more um helpful and just like like i said a christian muscle we haven't gotten to exercise um regularly in a long time yeah i think we're going to i think we're going to be forced to to do a workout here pretty soon so yeah yeah, (laughs) hopefully less painful than it needs to be let's say that i'm hoping that there are some folks watching who uh maybe they're open to what you're trying to do there and what you're putting forward what words of encouragement would you give to a pastor or somebody working in a church who wants to try and experiment with some of this? Yeah, uh, I certainly hope you do. And and I would be happy, more than happy to talk with anyone or or be a voice of encouragement for anyone. You can email me at carrie at the Uh and and just on that very practical piece, I would love to be a support Carrie like the scary movie, C-A-R-R-I-E. <laughs> And, <laughs> but uh, from a, from a broader, you know, more conceptual standpoint, I would say, uh, in my work with pastors, traditional and otherwise, uh, I am seeing that a pastor today doesn't just benefit from having facilitation skills, but really by necessity, how I define pastor these days is by having facilitation skills. These impulses, these muscles, these pursuits that I keep referring to um, are just part of where we are, how we're meeting spiritual needs in the culture we're in, even across lots of theological divides, that remains the case, that those sorts of skills, those listening skills, people are lonely, people feel unseen, unheard, Christian and otherwise, congregants and otherwise, having a having a, an emphasis on growing your own facilitation skills and meeting people that don't believe like you do, you're even going to ha- hear yourself articulate things about your own commitments you haven't before when the posture is more about seeking to understand before being understood. Thank you, St. Francis and later Steve Covey. Um, <laughs> that, that, that that makes the world feel different, even as it still grows us as Christians and as Christian leaders. Um and I would also, yeah, yeah, that's probably the main thing I would, I would want to say there's, there's so, there's so much and really just that you're not alone and that it, it might feel scary, but it's not going to feel scary for long. Yeah. Um, and that there is, there are trainings. We do trainings as the church lab for facilitators. Oh, that was the the last thing I wanted to say was, um, I would involve yourself in a dialogue before trying to lead one. And whether it's through the church lab, which we do digital dialogues every other week, um, but there may be local resources in many urban areas, there are going to be lots of local resources you can use to participate and kind of get your own sense and feel for what it means and and how it moves. And then you'll start to kind of get a sense of how it might make sense for your own community. Okay. Uh, if folks want to poke around the, the broader Multi-Faith Matters website where this podcast is housed, they can find a consulting page with your information and what you offer. And on the stories page, they can find the story of the church lab and other churches. But uh, how can folks get in touch with you if they want to find out more and support your work? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, if you go to the churchlab.org, uh, there is a place to sign up for our updates. Uh, and you can, there's also a contact form where if you have a specific question for me, it'll ping me. And then again, you can directly email me at Carrie, C-A-R-I-E at the churchlab.org. And any or all of those ways are great ways to connect with what we're doing. And I'd be really happy to, to be a support to anyone out there who's interested in this type of work. Awesome. I can't recommend your work enough, Carrie. Again, she's been a real blessing to the Multi-Faith Matters team and a a whole lot of people. So uh, thank you for taking the time out for the podcast today. 
Thank you, John, and for all that you're doing for the same movement.